Well, let's start. My name is Jonas Merberg. I'm the CEO of the Green Hydrogen Organization. And it is uh, absolutely great to have this uh, meeting on finance for a just renewable energy and green hydrogen economy. The whole idea with this meeting was after the many high level, very senior conversations throughout today, that we would end it in a way where the other or start this conversation where many other conversations have ended. I think we know um, a lot of the issues and really look at what kind of concrete, practical solutions are required for large scale renewable, the green hydrogen economy in developing countries and emerging economies. So really, what is it that works? Where do we see innovative ways to unlock capital for that crowding in of private investment uh, and so on? I think we all know those challenges and really focus at what are the solutions a little bit into the detail. And that is what we hope to, to discuss over the next uh, 45 minutes. We're very grateful to have uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mohamed Salem here from Mauritania. Um, thank you. We worked very much together with your government. Um, your president spoke incredibly eloquently an hour ago about green hydrogen when he and a number of other heads of states launched the African Development Bank's new infrastructure alliance. We've also worked with you on the so-called uh, Nouakchott message. Franny Lottier and many others have provided input to this. What we hope that this can be is a sector specific platform for input to the Bridgetown agenda. So our sliver into the summit, we hope can be based on this. And, Many of you have heard how the president of the World Bank and others are now asking for concrete proposals. The Nouakchott message does not contain that, but we now need to put those on paper and feed them in. And I really hope that we together between now and COP28 can work on some of those proposals and share them amongst uh, not just the World Bank, but also many other development banks and so on. With that, it's great to have you here. And um, I ask you all to be brief. Let's have a relaxed, informal conversation at the end of the day. So brief remarks, and then we can hopefully come back and drill into a number of different topics. The floor is yours, Joe. Je voudrais vous remercier d'avoir invité notre pays à participer à ce panel de haut niveau. Euh, mon propos va s'articuler autour de trois points. Premier, d'abord, quelques constats et remarques liminaires. Le premier constat, c'est que les énergies renouvelables, et en particulier en ce qui concerne euh, l'hydrogène vert, présentent un potentiel énorme. Non, non seulement pour euh, mitiger les facteurs qui aggravent le changement climatique, mais aussi pour une croissance durable, euh, pour, la, pour la création d'emplois décents et la lutte contre la, la pauvreté. La seconde euh, remarque, c'est que l'Agence internationale pour l'énergie a estimé que sans le développement à grande échelle de l'énergie à bas carbone, le monde avait peu de chances d'atteindre les objectifs de Paris sur les changements du climat. Troisième remarque, euh, c'est que l'Afrique euh, dispose d'un potentiel énorme euh, d'énergie renouvelable et euh, minéraux critiques qui peuvent lui permettre de jouer un rôle majeur dans le développement de cette économie nouvelle qui est déjà en marche. Quatrième remarque euh, préliminaire, c'est qu'une étude de McKinsey a estimé en effet que la production des six pays membres de l'Alliance africaine de l'hydrogène vert, en l'occurrence l'Afrique du Sud, 
euh, l'Égypte, la flique sœur d'Égypte, le Kenya, le Maroc, la Mauritanie et la Namibie pourraient atteindre 30 à 60 euh, mégatonnes d'hydrogène d'ici à 2050. Euh, en ce qui concerne la seconde partie, concerne notre pays, c'est que euh, notre pays, la Mauritanie, dispose d'importantes ressources renouvelables qui sont estimées à près de 4000 mégawatts éoliens et solaires, dont 500 mégawatts presque uniques par leur qualité et leur complémentarité qui peuvent, développer, qui peuvent être développées même sous les conditions environnementales les plus, euh, les plus contraignantes, ce qui, ce qui est un avantage comparatif majeur pour nous. Euh, euh, je, et puis la troisième partie, euh, elle concerne une contrainte majeure qui a été longuement discutée aujourd'hui, je crois, c'est la contrainte de l'accès aux, aux différentes ressources pour développer cette énergie. C'est le financement. C'est la, la grande contrainte pour, pour donc nous tous et pourquoi notre pays trouve que ce sommet, en effet, de Paris est extrêmement important parce qu'il envoie un message clair la nécessité de réformer euh, le pacte financier tel qu'il a été fait au cours des dernières décennies. Euh, la, la, la troisième partie, j'ai été dit par nos collègues, c'est ce qu'on appelle le message de, de Workshot, qui est pour nous extrêmement important. Je vous le livre en six remarques seulement. Première remarque, c'est que l'appel de donc, le message de Workshot, c'est l'appel aux pays importateurs d'hydrogène vert pour créer rapidement un marché de, donc, de l'hydrogène vert. Le second, le second message de Workshot, c'est l'appel aux pays développés, aux institutions financières, de développement et aux fonds privés afin d'assurer une augmentation massive du financement mixte qui est, qui est particulièrement utile et qui est la clé à la fois de la célérité et de la, pour que tout cela soit en effet euh, transparent, ce qui est requis pour permettre le financement des projets d'hydrogène vert à très grande échelle. Le troisième message, c'est l'appel à l'augmentation du volume et des instruments de garantie adaptés afin d'attirer à grande échelle les capitaux privés. C'est ce à quoi, en tout cas au niveau de nos pays, on s'attelle. Le quatrième message, c'est le renforcement du soutien au projet euh, le long de toute la chaîne de valeur de l'hydrogène vert. Le cinquième message, euh, vous, vous le savez déjà, c'est la mise en place d'un véhicule africain de financement des énergies euh, renouvelables et de l'économie de l'hydrogène vert. Et enfin, euh, la mise en place des partenariats avec toutes les parties prenantes et en particulier pour ce qui concerne la, la société civile. Je vous remercie. Sous le message. Thank you so much, sir. That's, that's uh, very helpful. Um, I wonder if I, <clears throat> I can turn straight away to you, Franny. Um, you, you've been around um, multilateral development banks for, for a very long time. You played a role behind the scenes of Um, this summit. So I wonder if you could first just lift the curtain a little bit on the summit in terms of how you see things, what, what should we make out of it, um, and then go on to a little bit specifically look at the kinds of instruments. And for those of you who don't know it, one of the unique things with large-scale renewable and the green hydrogen economy things is the sheer size of things. We're talking about projects of It, not, not one or two, but five, 10 or more billion dollars. Uh, so it's, um, that, that, that makes it a little bit uh, different from a number of the other things that one often needs to encounter or handle um, in, in, in these sorts of private sector um, uh, activities in, in developing countries, money economies. Uh, thank you, Jonas, for the question, and also thank you for inviting me to this panel. I listened keenly to the minister's remarks, and I was part of the discussion at the spring meetings on the Nouakchott uh, Declaration. So I think uh, I would say three things. Uh, first, for this summit, what uh, is percolating behind the scenes for quite some time, and hopefully it will uh, burst uh, during this meeting, is that we are looking for really big ideas and the hydrogen, green hydrogen revolution is a big idea. So I think it fits very nicely within that. In fact, I remember even the uh, remarks of Prime Minister Motley this morning when she said, 
how dare President Macron invite us to talk about this? So let's dare, right? So I think green hydrogen fits in that category. The second thing I would say is that it, it relates very much to what the MDBs were created to do. They were created to solve big problems for the world because it was just after the war, all the major economies were destroyed and we had to rebuild the world almost from scratch. So if you think about the climate crisis we're facing now and the development crisis, MDBs are uniquely positioned to play that role. So I think this summit has that thread and that's why there's been so much responsiveness to the report that we put out on the capital adequacy framework for the MDBs. But then the third thing I would say is that in the search for unique solutions, the low income country problem jumps out massively as, an, as a unique challenge that we have to look at in different ways. And within that, if you take Africa, uh, within Africa, there are three things that make Africa unique for the green hydrogen revolution that fits this narrative of what do we do differently now that we are going towards this green, uh, low carbon future. Why one, Africa needs solutions in transport and in agriculture, both of which are the pathways for green hydrogen. If you think of green ammonia for agriculture and fertilizers, or you think of green hydrogen for transport solutions, it fits very nicely within that. Second, Africa is very rich in mineral resources, where it could therefore lead in the green metal processing or green mineral processing. And the role of green hydrogen is fantastic within that mix of, of metal processing and mineral processing. But thirdly, I think it's because when you look at the size of the continent, it could actually deploy that, those resources for itself and also for exports because it has highly developed port infrastructure for export, but it also has big needs and a big continent through which you could transport energy for, for those kind of solutions. So I think when you look at these three things, we are ripe for the kind of challenge you are asking us here to come up with actionable recommendations that would drive the green hydrogen uh, economy forward that we could put forward, which would require private sector solutions to come in, uh, particularly on project development, but also on financing. Having grant financing be used differently and more innovatively, which we have in our report, for example, capital cost buy down, uh, using it for guarantees and insurance, bringing in the private sector to take over risk that had already been uh, somewhat de de uh, 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 treated by the MDBs and so on and so forth. Could you, could you, these are exactly the sorts of things I think we need to understand a little bit better. Would you mind elaborating on those uh, um, um, ideas and how you think that we can reach scale up through, 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 through by, by heeding that advice? Yeah. So we can take some uh, examples from um, polio eradication. You take a country like Pakistan that had polio challenges to eradicate it. They went to borrow from the Islamic Development Bank. Islamic Development Bank had maxed out on its concentration risk for Pakistan, so could only give a small amount. So what did they do? They found a philanthropist, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who were willing to pay down the cost of capital for Pakistan to go with the Islamic development's balance sheet to borrow on the markets for polio eradication. Investors love that, especially if you tell them that I'm gonna take away your interest risk. And that's how you could raise the money to eradicate polio for Pakistan. Say, so why can't we do that for hydrogen or for any other major climate risk? So I think that's one way to do it. The second example, you look at the, uh, the uh, bridge in uh, Abidjan that was funded by the African Development Bank. It was a toll bridge. The African Development Bank took equity into it, de-risked the whole project. The project was up and running. And cars were paying tolls. And then you can give that to the private sector. So you offload those assets to the private sector. You, get, you release that capital to be deployed for other infrastructure. That's something MDBs can do very well if you can de-risk and then offload their, their assets to the private sector. Third is an example where bilateral aid can come in a unique way. You have the uh, recent announced example of hybrid capital that uh, a group of shareholders at the African Development Bank have put together their 
commitments in, in callable capital to be used in sort of a guarantee to raise more capital. So you could say, if we need 10 billion for green hydrogen, why not have three or four of the largest shareholders of two or three MDBs put that their callable capital as a guarantee and you raise that 10 billion that can be used to deploy. So these are some very concrete ideas that can be used to move forward. Thank you very much. I think we'll ask to the, the <clears throat> we've got some very senior colleagues from multilateral development banks to comment on that. And then maybe from a private sector actor in this space. And then towards the end, if, if you wouldn't mind, I'm in incredibly pleased to have also um, our, our climate champion here, uh, Mahmoud, uh, uh, Ambassador, to, to hear how, how you see all of this. Is this an okay order? And thank you. Um, so should we start with you, Harry, uh, from uh, the EBRD? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. And um, I'll start with the advert, which is that EBRD did last year's finance our first ever green hydrogen project. It's not the biggest green hydrogen project in the world, but first is important. So we're very happy to have done the first one. Would you mind telling people so everyone? Yeah, what it was? sure. So it's it's um, it's financing a joint venture between Skatec, which is a Norwegian uh, renewable developer, and uh, Fertiglobe, which is a very large uh, fertilizer, uh, well, ammonia producer with operations in Abu Dhabi and also in Egypt. And the project is a is a will be a hundred megawatt electrolyzer in Ein Sokhna in in Egypt. Uh, and it will produce green ammonia going into what is an existing very large project producing conventional ammonia. Um, and where does that product end up? Well, initially, the, the main focus is on high end plastics. So there is a market for premium plastics made where you can claim that the plastic is green. And then in due course, we anticipate the green ammonia might become feedstock for green fertilizer. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, what can MDBs do about financing? The exciting and important thing about green hydrogen, and when I say green hydrogen, I think we all accept it's a shorthand for things that you can make that are derivatives of low cost renewables. So it's green hydrogen, but then that becomes green ammonia, green plastics, green fertilizer, green steel. And I, and I think one important thing for all development partners, all development actors is to try to maximize the value that developing countries can capture. So in a way, selling green hydrogen should be the last option. The best option would, frankly, I mean, you know, not just sell green steel, why not sell cars made of green steel? So I think that's one thing that we keep very far high in our mind, which is maximize the value that the developing countries can get out of what is a key feedstock, which is very low cost renewables. Um, so, but let, the demand for, the, for those products at the end of the day starts in developed countries. It's developed countries where the first demand will come for high-end green plastics or green steel uh, and so on. And that's actually really helpful because that gives you a highly bankable revenue stream. And what I think we're focused on is where do you use donor money and concessional money to catalyze that, that, that revenue stream? Because you've got a revenue stream, which is bankable. How do you then make a project out of that? And the critical point that Franny, I think, was alluding to is there's not a lot of donor capital out there. There's an awful lot of commercial capital. There's not a lot of donor capital. And there are a whole series of demands on it. And there are demands for non-bankable projects. There's demands to address loss and damage, demands to address adaptation. So you have to work from the assumption that this is a very large industry that's going to have to rely on a pretty small volume of donor capital to get it started. And I think that's where you have to, to really focus on the sorts of clever, catalytic ways and, you know, I can tell you, it can get a bit frustrating. I have an awful lot of developers who are queuing up saying, I've got a 100 megawatt electrolyzer. Can you get me a 50 million grant for it? No. <laughs> and, and even if I could, I wouldn't, because it's not the right thing to do. And I think, you know, cutting, cutting to the end of the story, I think you have to focus on um, interest rate buy down. I'm a very strong supporter of that, because I think it, it's a very effective way of reducing cost of capital, and therefore reducing project costs, increasing competitiveness, um, support for institutional capacity building, don't forget, if you want to sell a green product into the EU, you have to meet some pretty demanding regulatory requirements designed for a very different market. So, you know, that's about institutional support just to make sure you have the frameworks in place so that you can capture that premium. Um, it's about public infrastructure, um, the, the export facilities, the port facilities. Um, and then also, yes, it's about taking some of that high, high quality capital in the capital stack, which will then uh, de-risk projects, reduce risk, and again, reduce cost of capital. But I think you have to work on those key ingredients. Number one, ultimately, a bankable offshore revenue stream. And number two, you're not going to get much donor money compared to the size of the industry. So you have to think with that mindset. Thank you very much for that. And um, 
you know, there's of course a lot of things being done on, on the, that bigger, wider enabling environment. And we've captured some of that in, in sort of the SDG contribution and some other papers, uh, legal framework reviews and so on. Some of it is lying up there. And we're currently working with your government and a number of others on fiscal modeling and so on to make sure that we really try to, to make this, this resource development um, uh, um, sector uh, um, a responsible one. But Harry, would you mind coming back to, to your, um, you, you know, you, you said that there is a limited amount of, of a, a grant capital. What we hear a little bit is, you know, yes, we are big companies with deep pockets. We're prepared to take risk. We're prepared to take a lot of risk. But $100 million over three years to a FID is still a hundred million dollars. And that is where we need the grant money. What do you say to that? Honestly, I'm a bit skeptical. Um, I think, as I say, I mean, it is really striking how, how limited grant and concessional money is in the, in the bigger sustainability picture. And we, that's, that may not be a welcome fact, but it's a fact. And I think, and then you also have to recognize the, the very large number of development needs that, that has to be met. I mean, I think total volume of overseas, overseas assistance, you know, DA, across the whole of all the countries and all usage is 200 billion. And that's not a huge sum, especially when you consider the scales of a, the scale of a need. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, where is this in, what is this industry about? It's about meeting what is initially at least a developed world need for low carbon industrial products or, or and I, you know, I think ultimately that that's where the if that's where you know your need need your meeting. That's where the capital should be coming from. So I don't think coming and saying we want a large grant to fund you know the initial project costs is is the right is is a good use of, of donor money. I, you know, maybe I'm going to be no, 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 no. So, you know it, challenged by panelists, and I'm <laughs> open to being told that I'm wrong. But I but I think you have to think about much more surgical application of of money towards you know particular bottlenecks, and in particular bottlenecks that unlock value for the developed countries. Right, and that's where you think that that um, you you talked in particular about interest uh, rate. Uh, um, interest by then, I think it's a yeah. very efficient, clean way of doing it. Particularly yeah. because you don't need to do it for the whole project life. Mm -hmm. You know, often project interest rates are high at the beginning mm -hmm. because it's a high risk. You know, so it isn't you know. So you won't necessarily need to offer an interest rate buy down for twenty years, even if it's a twenty year project life. You say I'll do it for five years because it's a pretty reasonable assumption you're going to get a refinancing after five years with and you've got a proven project and you can get a lower cost. So that's an efficient way of doing it. I'm going to give you an example of what we're doing in Egypt. We're supporting the Egyptian government trying to kickstart. What are we doing? We're supporting the government designing a hydrogen strategy. We're supporting the Suez Canal economic zone, which is the, the sort of hub for hydrogen, to think about what do they need to provide? You know, how do they provide all of the shared facilities so that that's a, an interesting proposition for hydrogen producers? And um, we're, we're thinking about the regulatory question I mentioned. How do you show you know, the Egyptian electricity market does not look like a European electricity market. You know, concepts like bidding zones and settlement periods don't apply in Egypt. So if you have a regulation that says, prove to me that your hydrogen was produced in a period when your renewable producer was in the same bidding zone and the same settlement period, I can't do it. But so how do you, how do you make sure that there are equivalent concepts? So those are good uses of, of money. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think, sorry, taking a foreign sponsor and saying I'm going to pay for your first, you know, two years of, um, you know, development costs is not perhaps a good use, but but not quite such a high priority. As enough. I say, I'm very happy to be challenged no, no, and corrected. But that, that, that's great. And I saw Franny not, nodding there a lot. So that, that's clearly something maybe that we need to look a little bit more at. Let's try to focus on a number of the, sort of the financial things we can do. I think many here are, are aware of, there's a lot of efforts to provide technical assistance, build capacity and so on. I think for this conversation as part of this summit, uh, really keen to hear about those financial mechanisms that, that you're identifying and so on. Vivek, uh, you come from the IFC where you've been for a very long time. Um, do you agree with Harry? I normally do. Uh, and in this case, I largely do. Uh, we haven't yet done our first green hydrogen deal. So we're number two, but we try harder therefore. Yeah? Uh, but, you know, let me just break it up into three parts. I want to talk about the risk part. And normally I've talked about the four or five Cs, which is country risk, concession risk, 
currency risk and construction risk. I think with green hydrogen and emerging markets, we've got a fifth risk, which doesn't start with a C, political risk. And I really want to put this out there because what we don't want happening is having a huge hydrogen hub in Mauritania or Namibia or in Egypt, and their natural resources are going to subsidize and green the economies of Europe. Yeah. I just think grossly that will be unfair. And I want to say it up front. We need to make sure that the host country also, we cannot have the host country not meeting its NDCs, but other parts of the world who can afford it meeting their NDCs. So we need to be very mindful when these concessions are agreed upon that the host country gets the benefits. It's their natural resources. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say, I was struck about blended finance. And I largely agree with Harry. What we need is really, where is the blended finance going to go? You know, should it be used to just pay a higher price? Should it be used to drive down the cost of electrolyzers? Should it be used to drive down the cost of wind turbines and solar panels? And that is really important because if you were to calculate, and I've done a back of the envelope, you will need a hell of a lot of titanium and iridium to make those electrolyzers today. Where is it going to come from? You will need a lot of silica and silicon to make those solar panels. And what you don't want happening is because demand jumps up and it's going to jump up not 10x, but 100x potentially, if all the green hydrogen plants were to come and stream, somebody is going to be paying a higher price somewhere else. And it's going to be the smaller countries who don't have economies of scale for setting up solar farms, which will be 100, 200, 300 megawatts. So we just need to make sure that there is a fair and just mechanism when this happens. Here. So risks, where should blended finance go? And I promised myself before I got on the plane on Monday that at this in Paris, I will not talk about the problems, but I really think this is an opportunity and we've heard our new president say it, I've heard Maktar say it today, is we need to look at potentially, can we set up a platform or a facility which can finance green hydrogen across different markets? So what we offer investors, sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, is a platform that has got diversified assets which reduces their risk, that may have some developed country assets, preferably as well, I think. So that will reduce the risk profile. But when we start breaking down these risks, which I talked about earlier, if 70% of my plant in Egypt or in Mauritania is going to go to Europe, I don't see where is the country risk there. So for the lenders and the investors, country risk is out. Okay. Where is the currency risk? You're going to be paid in dollars. You take that out. So where, where is the concession risk? You take that out because your off-taker is a part one country. Construction risk, okay, let's get a pot of money to de-risk that. But you have to do it in a, with a platform approach with diversified assets. And I'm a big believer that we need to look at this from the mining of titanium and iridium and silicon to potentially the recycling. What's going to happen to those millions of solar panels in 20 years, which have been set up today for green hydrogen and for other uses. So I really think that, you know, true to what I said to myself before I got on the plane is, we need to start thinking on those lines. Yes, the needs are enormous. It's going to be a transition, as I keep saying. It's not going to happen overnight. And this is not a silver bullet. Let me be honest. You're just going to solve the world's decarbonization problems. It's going to be one step at a time. I love ambition. I'm an ambitious. I used to be at least quite ambitious. I'm now old and gray. But I think we've got a fantastic opportunity to make this happen. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Vivek. Vivek, when you say platform, I mean, you could argue that aren't all the MDBs a platform like that? So what could you elaborate a little bit? We want to focus on financial creative ideas here. What, 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 why are you putting that idea ahead of any others? So the MDBs are platforms, but let me put it bluntly. If I put EBRD's balance sheet and IFC's balance sheet together, we will not be able to finance the minister in Mauritania itself. We don't have that kind of capital. So when I say a platform, can call it a facility. Yeah, I've been told not to say platform because platforms for IFC mean something else now. So I need to be reminded of that. But it's really a facility where we get the MDBs, we get DFIs, we get donors. And I'm not saying create another DFI for hydrogen, please don't get me wrong, but create some sort of a global facility where you have a way, and it's going to take time to happen. It's not going to be easy because you're going to require tens of billions of dollars. But I want that commitment up front. I don't want to go out asking for money on a deal by deal basis. Right. We need, and that's where we blend it at that level. Great, up front. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
I, I also should um, apologize for not having acknowledged uh, the fact that we have a lot of uh, people listening in from uh, um, around the world. So that's, that's also great. Uh, turning now to one of the big uh, developers, um, Charles um, Hayworth, uh, you, you have a big project in Mauritania in a number of other countries. What is it really that you need? I mean, you have deep pockets as a company. What is it that is still a challenge? Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here presenting uh, and talking at this very important event, frankly. And I'm even more proud and happy to be sitting with the Minister for Mauritania, who really are one of our key partners, one of the most promising projects that we have in our portfolio. Um, there's, there's, there's two main messages I want to kind of put forward, which is uh, a common theme here. The first one is about the scale that we're talking about. And the numbers that I'm hearing on this stage are massively underestimating the scale that we're talking about. Um, there was a, a report last week from Deloitte that said this energy transition needs $9 trillion of funding before 2050. Okay, one third of that in the developing countries and one trillion just for North Africa alone. So the, the, the volume of capital that we're talking about deploying here is, is, is astronomical and it's, and it's absolutely needed to be able to help us meet the, the, the goals uh, by 2050 and all of the carbon abatement. And frankly, that can't be achieved just within the European Union or just within the United States. We need the developing world to supply these green electrons with the resources that they have um to, to, to make, move this forward and the other thing that in this road is that we can't do business as usual business as usual is exactly this incremental approach we'll follow the lng route and it'll take 30 years and that's too slow so we're living in exponential times right now and so we need exponential thinking and you know it's easy to say this it's harder to do but with there's really a step change in what we need to be thinking about we can't be thinking about single digit billions tens of billions we're measuring this in hundreds of billions and that's the level of thinking and that's where we need a lot of political support behind and we need the finance institutions to be thinking of ways to how do you mobilize hundreds of billions of dollars so that's one part um and then we're just talking about this the speed so we, we have to do this yesterday so it has to be done as quickly as possible the developers and the private companies are there and we're ready we've got the partnerships we're developing you know with with partners countries around the world and we need to do this you know qu as quickly as possible and that's where we need to call out we need the support from the financial institutions to come and work with us and really help to de-risk um as was mentioned by the ifc some de-risking to bring the cost of capital down to a competitive level will then allow us to develop these projects because as you said in our case we're looking at offtakes in uh, developed countries so a lot of the offtake risk is mitigated uh, construction risk frankly in many ways can be mitigated because these are renewable projects the world knows how to build renewables supply chain the renewable supply chain is there it's ramping up it's just how do we get over the last hurdle of risk to allow these projects to be financed move forward but it has to be at scale and what is that last hurdle of risk it's the last hurdle is the risk yeah. and to bring the cost of financing if you look at the actual financial outcome of these projects uh, actually the final hurdle is really about bringing the cost of capital down on the projects if you can do that that's the you know that's the final move the renewable resources in these countries we're talking about are the best in the world by far you'll have the lowest cost electrons in the world we need to finance them and then we need to use those electrons to sell to the rest of the world excellent um mahmoud um well, uh, Matilda is, is uh, part of the hosting here, and I think you sh are you happy, Matilda, to be last? Yeah. So, and, and we might uh, have a little bit of time for a question or two. But Mahmoud, you are uh, Egyptian, also uh, ED at the IMF. Um, you, you are a, a very important um, interlocutor here in the channel to, to COP28 as well. Um, what, what do you make out of all of this? So I'm not just interested in, in um, what kind of instruments or, or that, that you think are important, but also um, if you have any messages to us, what you think we can do better to make use of people like you? 
Right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, the nice introduction and the great honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, very important uh, panel. Um, like this time last year, when we were preparing for COP27, we're celebrating the number of MOUs uh, on, on hydrogen. Um, um, how many? Is it seven, eight? I, I think last count in the case of Egypt was north of 15. Many other countries um, have done something similar. And it's all about how to translate these MOUs, which are reflecting nice, good intentions. I signed many um, of these MOUs. I could be lucky than, uh, luckier than other ministers, but I would say from MOUs that you sign as a minister, you'll be lucky to get 10 to 15% of them translated into actual projects in the field. In, and I, I, and I was yeah, really a minister in much more of a calm environment globally uh, and regionally when it comes to finance uh, for projects. Um, so let me just uh, put some areas of emphasis here, linking our discussion now to COP28 and what we have been getting of signals of progress or lack of progress from, uh, from Paris. I think on COP28, we need really to go with projects and it's really very much refreshing to see another uh, kind of competition, EBRD saying, yes, we're the first, not the biggest, but we had the project under our belt. IFC is doing something similar. So we, we hope to see more of projects. Actually, in our pipeline of bankable investable projects, which is a kind of a competition that we had with our good friend Mark Carney, we have the assets show us the pipeline of investable projects, bankable projects. Green hydrogen came up several times, especially from Africa, from the consortium of countries that the Honorable Minister from Mauritania just uh, mentioned, and from many others. So in, and, uh, in terms of um, availability of ideas and projects uh, from the supply side, there is a great deal of, um, of interest. First uh, message, and I'm happy that when I was in Cote d'Ivoire in the CEO meetings, uh, there was a special uh, discussion uh, with good representation from the African consortium. And I'd like to share with you the following because I got that as well, uh, firsthand from the Ministry of Electricity from Egypt uh, through the IDSC. And these are basically, it seems fr frequently raised issues of concern coming from the field. First, for those of us who have been following green hydrogen, even from a narrower definition than what Harry used, um, it, is, it was basically, yes, we'll have the project today, we'll be exporting uh, green hydrogen tomorrow, and tomorrow is basically two to three years down the road. Latest announcements from Egypt, we are talking here about decent exports to Europe that would take no less than five to seven years. Had nothing to do with the project itself or with the good infrastructure that Charles and his colleagues are doing. It's basically the rest of the infrastructure, the grid that you need to, uh, to use to make sure that this grid is clean and green based on the definition, not mixed with any other source that could really raise doubts about uh, the color of green, right? So that for that to happen, this is a five to seven years affair. Of course, that could be accelerated. Our minister, and here this links us to the a reality check, the Minister of Electricity said, well, I'm the champion of renewables, and damn he is, he's pushing hard in all sources, green, uh, uh, wind, solar, want to do more and more with export orientation because we already now have excess capacity of electricity. But he has two uh, constraints, budget constraint in local currency and in foreign currency. So here, well, well the MDBs can really come to help and, and in this matter, small, I'm, I'm afraid to say that, because we were raised uh, with groups of economists uh, to learn translate to that interesting book by Schumacher about small is beautiful, not in this area. You all said it in different ways. It's not in this area of work. So where are the billions here that could really make our life easier without be, being more indebted as well? Because here, the more ambitious of us are not just looking for soft loans with greater grace period technical assistance coming, which is typical from the EBRD and the IFC and the World Bank, but basically more of private equity participation. And that's why there was more celebration coming with proposals from India, from Australia, and from the Gulf countries, because it's not just about borrowing, they are, they are coming with private equity participation. So this issue of cost, 
that have been raised in different ways need to be dealt with, not just cost of, uh, of a project, but cost associated cost when it comes to infrastructure. The second one is basically, actually I mentioned two now, the cost and the infrastructure cost. The, the, the third is basically about demand and perhaps, well, um, we're friends with Vivek for many years. And I say here, if you, if you are putting all of your eggs in, in the basket, even if it is a European basket, you need to consider some sort of consideration of risk of the partner and the purchaser um, of your, um, your good or your supply, generally speaking. And when it comes to energy, I would be more careful because the energy strategy of Europe, the energy policy of Europe hasn't been really stable during the last few years. It leaves a lot to be desired and we are in a free part of the free world. I'm, I'm happy to put the evidence on how unstable that energy strategy was for the Europeans and for their partners. So I would really put some sort of good uh, elements of discussion on seeing to what extent my um, buyer is going to be supplying me with this, the kind of stability and the risk associated with it or low risk associated with it just to comfort us. The other thing is basically about the research and development. One of the best examples I saw is coming from our brothers in Morocco. It's part of the consortium that the minister mentioned. I was happy to see that the, their company of the phosphate is coming strong on that, not with their knowledge in mining and phosphate production, but their investments in scholarship, uh, their investments in human capital, their investments in a research center associated with them. And actually the discussion in uh, Côte d'Ivoire was led by the, the, this center, not less sophisticated, then you, our good moderator today, do you know something about what they are talking about? And we have more investments in this side. So education, investments in this R&D uh, is very much needed. And of course, the impact on the community. If I'm putting all of that, and I listened, I was lucky to listen to the new president of the World Bank a couple of times today. He is super ambitious of many things, including infrastructure, quality of life, and climate. Fantastic. But I can tell him, and I can tell other MDBs, that your capital is going to make you very unhappy going forward. You will be as frustrated as many of your clients today. Vivek actually mentioned in a very subtle way, I'm not put uh, words in his tongue, but you say, well, I need more capital. And he's looking for partners from outside. Mm -hmm. Normally in my days when I was governor to the World Bank, my last resort could be other sources, but the first, and this could be just satisfactory to me, World Bank, African Development Bank, and at the time, there was not really that exercise of the capital adequacy framework. There was no concerns about whether these banks are efficient enough or not. The assumption that they are efficient, relatively speaking, than others, and they, they need to invest more in their efficiency. Mm -hmm. But now I have an evolution roadmap. Well, good luck with those who are sponsoring it. But as a client of these institutions today, representing them, I'm not happy with what I'm seeing. And the only good thing that I got from one of the round tables that the three pillars of this evolution roadmap of the MDBs may not be, be sequential, but could be happening in parallel terms. That the vision is more or less there. Thank you so much. We have 2030 agenda, we have Paris agreement, have SDGs. For me in developing world, this is more than enough for me as a vision. If you are not happy with 2030, we have 2063 for you ready for Africa. So these are visions supported by leaders, by heads of state and by civil society. Let's finish that and then you can think about post 2063 kind of arrangements. Then about the efficiency and operational model, yes. New world, we need to know more about sustainability, about digitalization. But there is no way that you can really go and get the attention of large, developers or the Larry Fink of the, uh, of the world, if your capital is going to be dwarfed um, along the time as we are seeing like that. I need to see EBRD 10 times of what it is. It's not about better or bigger. It, they are better than that they were yesterday. They need to be definitely better, but bigger is basically the thing that could really make me more comfortable. Gates Foundation, fantastic work. Philanthropies, we appreciate their work but they are not a substitute to the work of the MDBs for long-term finance, for concessional finance, and for the fact that, well, in relative terms, of course, they are owned by governments represented in their boards. In terms of governance, it's basic. When, it, when you deal with the philanthropists, you don't have any say on them. You rely on their good intentions in partnership and their goodwill, which is fine enough, but for now.
Mm. So this is the kind of a puzzle that we need really to solve. For those who are meeting not far from here in miles, but in hours, if you are going there uh, <laughs> uh, through the traffic, I think uh, 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 tomorrow we, I need to hear more than just the revolution, which has already been practiced about these catastrophic clauses. It seems that those who are proposing it with happiness, they haven't seen some of the latest contracts, including ones conducted by, by some of the MDBs in this, in, in this room. What we need to see is a promise for finance, technology, and support when it comes to incentives to make the change. Otherwise, we'll be talking about these projects, and instead of realizing them in two years, we'll be seeing them in 20 years. Mm. That shouldn't be the case. Thank you so much. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, we waited a long time to hear from you, Matilda. You are uh, our host here at the OECD. Um, the OECD does a lot in terms of um, creating architecture uh, for how we mobilize these sorts of funds. And uh, we're interested to hear what, uh, how you think that that can uh, be taken further. Thank you. Thank you. Let me first thank uh, also uh, the co-organizer of this event, the Green Hydrogen Organization. Uh, we are very happy to work with you on this topic. And because uh, we are the OECD, let me give you a couple of numbers on which we are basing uh, our work on, on this topic. And then I will tell you what we are doing at the OECD on, on that. So first, I mean, for us, the global de demand for hydrogen is set to increase very dramatically, you know, from about 100 million tons per year today to more than 500, 600 by 2050. And while all hydrogen currently produced is from fossil fuel, basically two thirds into 2050 should be uh, from renewable energy. So it's, it's, it's quite a significant shift. Uh, and this course, it has been mentioned by all of you, these, these require very capital intensive investment. That's what we are currently discussing across the value chain. And it was mentioned uh, that it's not only renewable electricity generation, but it's also to infrastructure, storage, etc. cetera. And uh, this will require, it was mentioned trillions, but let me mention what we have in mind here. It's several hundred billion dollars of investment each year. So it's really like big, big, big amounts. And with, a, of course, as it was also said, a, a significant share of this in, in uh, emerging and developing economies. Uh, so in terms of problems or challenges that we have, of course, uh, this green hydrogen, it's still a low mature technology uh, that comes with higher risks than to the more conventional ones. And we have also a lack of robust market infrastructures and clear definitions, standards, certification mechanisms, et cetera. It was mentioned by previous speakers also. So you, 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 you might have this challenge discouraging investments. And very importantly, further increasing this cost of capital. We're always going back to this cost of capital. You know, we, we had a discussion yesterday on that. So all these problems are further increasing the cost of capital that is a massive challenge. And of course, the thing we are discussing now today in this session is the problem of how to finance this. So let me now tell you what we are doing in the OECD to try to help in this regard. Um, so first, uh, in support of this year's breakthrough agenda report developed jointly by the IEA, the IREA, and the UN high level champions, we are building a series of case studies uh, to showcase the best practices for financing grid hydrogen uh, projects in emerging and developing economies. We are also working with partners like the World Bank in sharing insights on learning from how hydrogen projects are financed in the world. And we are providing example, I mean, of successful financing instruments, including all the mechanisms that were discussed so far, like, you know, risk guarantees, grants, con concessional loans, etc. And last year, uh, in November last year, we, put, we published a working paper for the COP, for the COP27, discussing how the governance of projects, how the, some innovative business models and financing instruments could play a role in emerging economies. And we have a project that is called Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization Program, CEFIN. And in this program, we are working in particular in South Africa and in Egypt. Uh, on developing 
particularly like these financing strategies for hydrogen and industry decarbonization more, more globally. So our work, our existing work, and we will continue uh, exploring these challenges and potential solutions more importantly, points to the importance of closing this financing gap through building capital allocation strategies and offering co-financing and risk mitigation measures that were discussed by previous speakers. So, um, and also one very important point is that, of course, having all these financial mechanisms, it's very important, but we need also to pair that with policy and regulatory frameworks that build investor confidence and reduce market uncertainty so that you can de facto mobilize private finance through public concessional finance. So I think I will stop here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, great. Look, um, we haven't given you the, the floor yet. If we could, have you got just a couple of minutes, uh, uh, we could just check that there are, uh, if there are a couple of quick questions. So be very brief, identify who you are and who you might want to put your question to. Um, and uh, I know you wanted to say something. Everyone, thank you so much, Jonas. Uh, my name is Mirko Mered. I'm a hydro green hydrogen ambassador uh, with the International Association of Hydrogen Energy and a lecturer here on hydrogen policy at Sciences Po. And HEC, just one, one quick question, because we'd like time. Uh, basically, no one's talking about the greenest hydrogens of all, which is basically natural hydrogen, geologic hydrogen. And the cost of a, of a geologic hydrogen project would be one third of that of an electrolysis based green hydrogen. So I'm not calling it not green. It is green hydrogen as well. It's the greenest part of, of hydrogen possible. Uh, why are we not talking enough about this in multilateral circles? Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone wants to pick that up? Charlie? No? Look, I, I can just, we hear about it, it comes up. I think there is a, we're not quite there yet. Um, uh, so the, the technology just isn't mature. I think there is a lot of R&D going in there in that space. So I think we will see it, but uh, uh, we have enough challenges with this that, that is in relative terms, a bit more mature. Yes, I mean, I can, I can say from a MDV perspective, we're agnostic. I mean, you know, we don't we, we just want to produce we want to help our countries develop and we want to help world decarbonize if that's the cheapest technically viable thing we'll do it we'll finance it um it's just as you know saying we haven't seen it come on come on the table yet and and we do have one of the things i worry about a little bit especially you know i won't mention nuclear fusion here but i will mention nuclear fusion we have two amazing technologies right in front of us wind and solar cheap scalable deliverable and it's very important not to get distracted from maximizing the value out of those technologies right now. Totally. Excellent. Next. Um, yeah, my name is Florian. I work at the OECD. I have a question for NDBs and private sector. Uh, Mr. Patak highlighted the importance of balancing uh, the benefits between North and South when it comes to uh, mitigation climate change thanks to green hydrogen. Uh, my question is about the importance of balancing benefits between private and public. Um, so the public sector is offsetting uh, the risk by different mechanisms, guarantees, concessional finance. 10, 20 years from now, when the projects are mature and uh, that they are, bene they, are, they are creating profits, how can we make sure today in the contracts that are uh, signed between the public and private uh, actors, how can we make sure that the benefits of tomorrow, the, sh the, the, the profits will be shared as well? Uh, do the MDBs are planning to design contracts taking this into account today? And how is the private sector open to such a discussion? Uh, yeah, that's based on my, on my reading of Mariana Mazzucato uh, book on uh, uh, mission economy. Yeah, excellent. Uh, anyone wants to have a go at that? Uh, Franny? Uh, two quick points on that. I think we have uh, a historical track record of MDBs doing that in the concessional contracts that were signed for water, for toll roads, and so on, where you have the opportunity for renegotiation once the revenue stream is clear, and those are embedded at the beginning, so that you enter into a concession like the Pakistan toll road, where it wasn't clear really what the percentage of cars would be, how much they would pay and so on. And then you got the re renegotiation after that. That has also been done for electricity and for water supply. So I think there is 
uh, their model contracts for that. But the second question is more around the model of financing, because if you look at the equity models, they tend to much better allocate future benefits in, in, a, in a more reasonable way. So you, because you don't have valuation, very good valuation at the beginning, uh, but then if you can use venture capital models and other such structures, you can get there. I think the closest example is the channel tunnel. Uh, when the channel tunnel was being negotiated and, and the contracts were being designed, there was very uh, huge uncertainty as to how much it was actually going to cost because we had to tunnel underwater. There was huge uncertainty on the technology that would be rolling on that tunnel, the, the railway side and so on, but they did still manage to come up with concession contracts that were renegotiated to redistribute the revenues going forward. So those are examples that we can learn from. Excellent. Super brief, Vivek. So just 30 seconds, I'd say two things. One is, I hope we don't have super profits because I really hope that prices come down to such an extent that that may not happen. Second is, we need to be very careful because if you're going to take a lot of donor money up front, we need to really make sure that you have a waterfall in a way that maybe the donors get something back or it's recycled. Because I think what will look terrible at the end of the day, and that's where governments will start to question, is if you're making super profits because of donor money, which helped you get there, I think that's a fundamental flaw in a concession. So we need to really learn from what happened in solar and wind, where prices came down very significantly. I'm hoping the same happens here. So that's what we need to balance, really. Excellent. Mahmoud. One general point, really, because this issue of risks and contracts need really to be guided by what you just mentioned in areas related to governance and transparency, because we are working in areas, including in solar and wind, when the cost elements are changing, and some of them actually in the right direction that we like to see. What we, in the initial um, uh, studies for Ben Ban in, in Egypt and Wazazat as well in Morocco, the cost of, uh, of solar cells were multiples of what we are having now, and actually it was much more even when we're starting the project. But now this is something that in the right direction, but without governance and transparency, a successive government would tell you, well, you went to the wrong contract and you wasted the uh, public money and you would have gone through a different technology or a different time. So here, you take the best kind of advice based on the available information. You need to be very much transparent in the discussion, including entertaining one of these ideas that just came out. You are happy with what you do. I have an idea that could be costing you 70% less. You would be really wrong. And I'm happy that Harry responded. Well, if there is that technology, let's uh, because we are not ideological about these things. One more thing, when it comes to cost, and now Harry reminded me about it when he broadened the, the discussion uh, of green hydrogen beyond what's normally celebrated in, in exporting uh, uh, energy, which is basically in the heart to abate sectors, fertilizers and steel. Now, for those who are close to Europe, like us in Egypt and Morocco and the rest of Africa, now there is the CBAM coming with its conditions. Well, many people say, well, let's create our capital, uh, the carbon market, to take care of some of the issues, that is helpful. But decarbonizing is essential. And for that to happen, we need definitely green hydrogen could help in that, but definitely some decent support in uh, decarbonization through uh, uh, JetP. And the JetP with the G7, all of them are members of the OECD, few of them are in Europe. They are only happy to support the phasing out from coal in the projects that are in existence so far. And the latest winner was Senegal just uh, today or yesterday. What we need to see in the hard to abate sectors that jet P money could really be there to support decarbonization. And that could really be directly or indirectly through funding green hydrogen projects. Thank you so much. We got one last question. Jamie Drummond, uh, you are with Sharing Strategies, a kind of a mega convener on the civil society side um, and, and a key driver also behind uh, many of the feeding in civil society into the Bridgetown Initiative. Um, today, we haven't really talked much about civil society, but um, a quick question. I'm always, I'm always afraid of anyone claiming to represent civil society. It is a, I mean, there's many and it's diverse, um, but thanks, Jonas. 
Uh, actually, my question was was actually answered very much by what Dr. Mahindalin just said. Um, the importance of governance and transparency in this. Look, when we look at, and, and I actually really want to agree with what Harry Boyd Carpenter said, uh, as a veteran campaigner for ODA, it is going to get harder to get any of it um, for anything um, alternative with Deutschland are doing better than the SPD in Germany right now. The political climate is extremely tough. Um, and uh, so I, we're all game for it, we're up for it, but it's going to be very hard. So trying to build in from the outset that citizens participate, not as a problem that slows down the process, but as part of a solution that gets better medium and long-term results and faster results is essential. Uh, building in civic scrutiny, armed with better data, you know, supporting SDG KPIs, making sure that the money actually goes to where um, the projects claim it will, I, I think will be absolutely essential. When we talk about these trillions, part of me is very excited about the imperative working toward that. And the other part of me is terrified because there's a whole army of people who look at trillions and their uh, eyes light up for the wrong reasons. And we need to be armed on that front from the outset. So engaging citizens and really investing in governance and transparency and, and, and uh, accountability will really help make the case and might help mitigate some of what um, Harry Boyd Carpenter said. On those um, who wouldn't agree with that, uh, thank you so much, Jamie. Absolutely, I'm sure we wholeheartedly agree. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, we really appreciate that you've come around. Matilda, did you want to say something? You picked up the microphone. The last word goes to you. Maybe I would like to try to summarize some of the key messages. It was a super rich discussion, so I don't know if... I'm not, not sure we need to summarize so much. But, uh, but the, Just if, highlighting some But, but key if messages. there is something you want to highlight, please. Yeah, there are four things I want to highlight. Please. <laughs> Bear with me. It's like, first, Clearly, this we, we have very large scale projects. It's a massive opportunity for Africa in particular. One of the challenges, not the only one, but one of the clear challenges is financing. And it will be in the short term, difficult, complex to have this fully financed by the private sector. So the public finance and the MDBs in particular will have a key role to play clearly uh, to help reducing the cost of capital by you know, providing guarantees, de-risking uh, solutions, etc. Third, still public and concessional finance is limited, clearly. So uh, you need to work on the regulatory and the framework, enabling conditions, and it was mentioned uh, just the governance and in particular transparency and disclosure, that's critical. You need, you know, uh, to, you, we need new solutions to scale up quickly, rapidly. Uh, so it could not be business as usual, as it was mentioned. We need at least these platforms. I mean, this, how to make these platforms work. And as you said, uh, Mahmoud, we need definitely bigger capital from the MDBs. And uh, last but not least, maybe the, the, we should pay attention to the socioeconomic benefits in the countries. Uh, and uh, it was mentioned we need to invest massively also in human capital to accompany this transition. So these are the four messages that I wanted to highlight. Well, thank you very much. That was very neat and elegant uh, summary. Thank you all. Let's give them an applaud.